Welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, that the main campus of the University of Regina is situated on Treaty 4 lands. These are the territories of the Cree, Salto, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis. Today, these lands continue to be the shared territory of many diverse peoples from near and far. We're here to talk about prison education, and I'm going to begin with some difficult but important stats that are directly related to this land acknowledgement. The most recent report of Canada's Correctional Investigator states that Indigenous people constitute 26.4% of the federal prison population, while Indigenous people comprise only 4% of the Canadian population. In Saskatchewan's provincial prisons, Indigenous people regularly constitute between 80 to 90 percent of the prison population, while Indigenous peoples comprise only 15.6 percent of the province's population. I began with a land acknowledgement that you're going to be hearing a lot at Congress. And I want to emphasize that learning how to share these lands and renewing the important relationships that these treaties mark is central to the difficult and uh, crucially important reconciliation work that we're going to be doing over the course of the next seven generations and beyond. Senator Murray Sinclair has provided a framework for reconciliation and the calls to action that he proposes in the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. As he points out, the causes of over-incarceration are complex, with convictions resulting from an interplay of factors, including the legacy of residential schools. So how do we, following call to action number 30, commit to, rep uh, to uh, eliminating the over-representation of Aboriginal people in custody over the next decade? When we read the report, we're reminded quite often of our treaty responsibilities, which is why it's important to remind ourselves that we live on treaty territories. In call to action number 42, which is really a reminder, Senator Sinclair points out that recognizing and implementing Aboriginal justice systems is consistent with our treaty responsibilities, as well as with the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But committing to, rep uh, to eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in custody and responding to the harmful legacy of residential schools will involve a multi-pronged approach and dedicated efforts. There is no one answer. For those of us who follow the stats and the stories that are tangled up in Canadian and American incarceration, Prison education has emerged as a beacon of hope, possibility, and positivity. Now, I haven't asked our speakers today to address these complicated issues uh, that I've just raised. Instead, I'm introducing this panel in this way because if we understand these calls to action as all of our responsibility on these treaty lands that we share, this stands as one of the most important community connections to think about as our speakers discuss the potential and possibilities that prison education represents. We're really very fortunate to have these impressive speakers with us here today. They come representing very different models of prison education. Uh, they come bearing inspiring messages about the power and potency of the liberal arts. Uh, which I'm sure Max will qualify and quantify for us. And they come to discuss the importance of breaking down walls so that we can fully interact with and learn from each other as human beings. I want to thank our sponsors for making this happen, the University of Regina's Community Connections Program, the Department of English, the Department of Justice Studies, the Department of Religious Studies, and the Department of Women's and Gender Studies. I'm going to introduce our speakers in turn, uh, and once uh, they've all done speaking, we'll have some time remaining for questions. Uh, at 10.30, 
uh, we'll move on to the Rick Atrium, uh, which is just a quick walk down the hall and we can share in some food and conversation and please do come, there's lots of food. Uh, also become, uh, come because at 10.50, uh, there's going to be a workshop led by Denise and Simone. Uh, and we'll be able to learn about the pedagogy uh, of Walls to Bridges in action. Uh, our first speaker, Max Kenner, conceived of and created the Bard Prison Initiative as a student volunteer organization when he was an undergrad at Bard College in 1999. After gaining support of the college and cooperation of the New York State Department of Correctional Services, he has overseen the growth of the program into a credit bearing and subsequently degree granting program in 2001. Kenner has led the expansion of BPI from a pilot program with 15 students to a nationally recognized educational initiative, enrolling 300 students within six campuses in correctional facilities throughout New York. Kenner has become a leading advocate for the national restoration of college and prison and frequently speaks publicly in a wide variety of forums about the BPI model and, uh, in education and criminal justice policy. Kenner is co-founder of the Consortium for the Liberal Arts in Prison, uh, which supports colleges and universities in establishing college and prison uh, programs in more than 10 states. Kenner also serves as Vice President for Institutional Initiatives uh, and Advisor to the President on Public Policy and College Affairs at Bard College. He was a 2013-2014 Fellow in Residence at the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard University. In 2014, Kenner was reappointed to serve on Governor Cuomo's New York State uh, Council on Community Reentry and Reintegration Reentry Subcommittee. In 2016, Kenner received the John F. Kennedy New Frontier Award and the Tribeca Disruptive Innovation Award and was named to the Chronicle of Philanthropies 40 Under 40. He is also a past recipient of the Manhattan Institute's Richard Cornell Award for Social Entrepreneurship and the Smithsonian American Ingenuity Award in Education. Please help me to welcome Max Kenner. Thank you, Jason, and uh, to the entire Congress and university here at Regina. It is uh, a real privilege and wonderful opportunity to be with all of you. The issues that Jason raised at the outset in his introduction uh, are not specific to Canada. They are certainly not specific to North America and they are, at the very least, endemic throughout the Anglo world. The work that I do is difficult to describe in, in a perfectly pithy or succinct kind of way because it happens truly at the intersection of two social crises that we typically imagine as being discrete from one another. We don't have a language for talking about them as a single phenomenon, right? And I apologize in advance, the majority of uh, the vocabulary I have and the majority of the uh, context that I work in is in some ways specific to the United States and in other ways it is not. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the distinction and frankly talking about the way uh, that Canada and the UK and Australia and South Africa in particular uh, have, in my view, done a poor job of emulating most of the worst of what we do in criminal punishment in the United States um, and not always the best. We would do better if the imitation went in the other way down the street uh, rather than from the United States towards all of you. But in the last generation, that tragically has not been the pattern. So we now have this terminology for this phenomenon, which we call mass incarceration. It's important to remember that 15 or 20 years ago, the phrase mass incarceration didn't exist. But what that means, at least in the, in the context of the United States, 
is that we now, for a generation, incarcerate more and more people for longer and longer periods of time, often for smaller infractions of the law. We do that to people when they are at younger and younger ages. And specific to the question of education in prison, what's most extraordinary is that as we have done that, as we have made prisons a centrally important series of institutions in our social fabric, right? In the United States, investments in punishment have replaced, sort of a mirror image, uh, investments in housing, mental health, health care, and most specifically, higher education. If you look at state budgets across the United States in the 1990s in particular, you look at a radical divestment in state higher edu education, public university systems in New York and California and states across the country, and a perfect image, mirror image, of the opposite, of hundreds of millions of dollars in state by state investment in prisons, right? So what was, what's particularly counterintuitive about this Again, is as prisons became more important to us and more of our neighbors and more of our children and more of our friends and relatives found them to be defining institutions in their lives, we also made them worse. You'd think as we invested more and as they impacted more people, we would make an effort to make them better. But we did the exact opposite. Okay? And you know, it's, it's incredibly tragic that one in the American context, you know, does not even really need to make the point because everyone knows it. One doesn't need to always make the point that who ends up in these institutions is not a neutral phenomenon, right? We can talk about that in terms of ethnicity, or the history uh, and legacy of slavery and Jim Crow in the United States, or we could talk about in terms of geography, right? But overwhelmingly, these institutions are filled with young men of color from specific neighborhoods or geographic uh, areas, right? Uh, social scientists and geographers and statisticians in the, you know, in the past 10 or 15 years have done research which proves that in, for example, South Brooklyn, or in parts of Queens, or in Chicago, or Los Angeles, there are individual urban blocks and cities across the United States where we invest a million dollars a year per block incarcerating residents of those blocks, right? So while there are more people in prison in the United States than ever before, and by most measures anywhere in history, Right? It's not a, a phenomenon that's spread across the landscape. It's highly concentrated based on who you are, obviously how much money you have, uh, the color of your skin, and the school districts and zip codes in which you live, in which you were born. Okay? So that, that's a brief summary of what's called mass incarceration. And I want to, um, you know, there, we can have all kinds of contentious disagreements about where this came from, and how it came to be, and who is to blame. But I would just posit that I think we can all agree that in the United States, mass incarceration is somehow, and in some way, a response to the relative success and failures of the Civil Rights Revolution. What, in the context of speak, uh, speaking at this university and before this Congress, and with this extraordinary opportunity that you have in Canada uh, and in the work that Jason has done, I don't think it's useful to focus our attention on our failures in law enforcement or criminal punishment exclusively. That's not to eschew the reality of them. But the fact is, again, this work that we do at BPI, that you are considering taking on in some form or another here in Canada, happens at this intersection 
on the one hand about discussions of criminal punishment, its effectiveness or shortcomings and failures, and on the other hand, another crisis. It's a crisis that's not as, quite as peaked here in Canada as in the United States, uh, but the question of how we train young people to face the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, the question of college opportunity, access, rigor, and achievement, right? And the more we think of these as two separate problems, I think the more we will fail, okay? So we can have discussions about mass incarceration, which point fingers at whoever they may be, conservatives or law enforcement or you know, whoever you know, the villain of the a moment or an issue might be. But as leadership of university systems, as academics, uh, as decision makers in higher education, I think we have to acknowledge that the cynicism which led to something like mass incarceration is not something that is alien to our institutions. We have not succeeded, certainly in the United States, at making our best college universities something that, some things that are truly distinct from social clubs, where you attend institutions like your parents or grandparents did. Right? We have not made the case to young people that the arts and sciences matter to them in a way that suggests that they are ready and able to take on the challenges that we face collectively, right? The crisis of confidence among leadership in the humanities has impacted Western civilization internationally in a profound and destructive way. So I think, and the, what informs the way we do our work at BPI, is that we should, as educators, as people who are concerned about the future of young people, which in the same way law enforcement is, but on the, another side of the ledger, we should accept and bear responsibility for these disasters, okay? So when we do the work that we do at BPI, we put academics first. We don't think of ourselves as, for example, prison or correctional education. We are an educational institution that is in the market for phenomenal students. And we are fully aware that the way that we do college access and college admission and college opportunity in the United States is broken, okay? And so we seek out students that will take the best advantage of what we have to offer, which is the ability to teach and knowledge about the arts and sciences, right? We've created a series of campuses within correctional institutions where we manage decisions about admission, we manage decisions about curriculum, uh, and we provide incarcerated women and men across New York with uh, to, uh, an academic program which is of exactly the same quality and breadth and rigor of what we offer on campus. These are students who overwhelmingly uh, failed in conventional education and who've gone on to do extraordinarily well. They study mathematics, the natural sciences, German, Spanish, Mandarin languages, right? Economics. BPI alumni who've been released from prison in the past year have gone on to complete graduate degrees at places like Columbia, Yale, and NYU. Okay? They achieve all the things that we hope conventional students on our campuses would achieve in precisely the same ways, if not with a little more dramatic success. They make us realize precisely because the professionals in our best education schools at our top universities and in our among the professionals who intellectual about, intellectualize about things like crime, because the outcomes in their lives are perceived to be impossibly good in low rates of recidivism, becoming middle class taxpayers, you know, 
those sort of societal metrics, but also on the educational metrics, where they accomplish, how far they come from algebraic illiteracy to doing second or third term calculus and becoming majors in math, right? From being someone who before prison had never read a complete book from going on to going on to deciding that it was really important to become proficient in reading German so you could read Hegel in the original, right? Uh, things that are so often perceived to be impossible, we can accomplish. And these students do it because they recognize what is at stake for them in these classrooms. When we work on campus at Bard College with conventional students, when you work with your undergraduates at a place like the university here, what we've learned from these students is that it seems obvious once you say it. What we do on campus, the overwhelming majority of the time, is try to convince students that what we do and the things we care about matter. And once you convince a student of that, right, all the sociological data goes up in smoke. Students whose parents never went to college can thrive and go to the best graduate school. Students who come from the poor zip codes can thrive and go to the best graduate school. Students who failed out of high school or junior high school can thrive and go to the best graduate schools if they think what we do matters to them. And these students know that from the first instance. And our view is when we look at the landscape, uh, particularly in a place like the United States with really limited resources in a society where we really have ceased to believe collectively in the very concept of education. That we as educators should be seeking out students that will make the most of what we do and what we have to offer and the first richest and most symbolic place we can do that are our correctional institutions. So I am going to uh, just I'll apologize in advance for a little bit of propaganda, but we're going to show a very short film about uh, BPI students. It takes place uh, every year, every spring. We'll do one in about 10 days. Uh, we do graduation ceremonies within the prisons. Uh, so I'm gonna show you some footage from one of those ceremonies that happened uh, just a few years ago. Uh, and we will um, then proceed from there. Imprisonment must be accompanied with an effort to give people a second chance. And the only way to make a lasting impression is the transformation of a personality, and that's what we call education. My hermano is my brother. The kind of education we provide here is the most useful education in the world. It's the kind of education that actually allows you to live with yourself over time. If you don't have a trained mind and a tuned heart, you will not go anywhere in the 21st century. Du Bois said that education ought to do three things. First, it ought to improve your character. Second, increase your knowledge. And third, it ought to help you to earn a living. And one of the great tragedies in our nation today is that we have turned that ascension upside down. And we have put building character on the bottom, earning a living on the top. And is there any wonder why we are faced with some of the major challenges that we face in America today? I come into class to tell Professor Shields that I was dropping the class. I stayed for the rest of the night and she went on to teach the class as she normally would have. She'd go from the, from the blackboard to her desk, jot something down, and then go back to teaching linear equations and quadratics and synthetic division. <laughs> At the class break, she brings over the sheet of paper that she'd been writing on. And what she'd been doing, even as she's teaching the rest of the class, she's coming up with a list of options on how I might survive the class. And then she asks me 
for 10 more classes. She asked me to give her 10 more classes to see if she can find new ways of teaching the material and see how I felt about it then. I know that a popular and heated contention against what we are accomplishing here today is that this is a free education for us. But we understand that no, this isn't a free education. We have to work harder not only for who we are and what we've done, but also for the future of those who won't have the opportunities that we have. And that does include victims. That responsibility is neither cheap nor free. I'm going to ask you to imagine yourself in a cell. You hear your neighbor's conversation. Well, I wrote my project most of the time in my cell, having nowhere to go. But the best strategy for me became to remain awake when everyone else went to sleep. When do you sleep? When you collapse. I tried um, eight times to get into, into the bar program. And after eight times, I think I have the record <laughs> of the guys to try to get into bar. I want you to get a college education now. I do have one. Just got to continue. I don't know if I'm getting emotional in my old age, but I got very emotional with the speeches. We're sitting there like, what's going on? What's wrong with me? <laughs> but I guess I'm living through them in a way. You know, up, up They're saying much of the same stuff that I probably would have said had I had the chance to speak. I'm doing this to become better, to, to improve myself. I came to prison when I was 16, so now I'm, tw I'm 27 years old. That was real. Now I'm an adult. Now it's responsibility. I'm getting married, you know. <laughs> this, Can you introduce your wife? This is my fiance, Brie, Brie Morris. <laughs> love of my life. She's she's the Sorry. highlight. She's the highlight of my life. I'm so proud of you. I'm speechless. Mm -hmm. This man intrigues me every day. <laughs> yeah. I love you. So what is um, important to remember uh, when seeing a, a short film like that one is that the students that figure in, in that video are not analogous to, they're not a metaphor for, they are not, um, you know, some, somehow symbolic of. They are precisely the same people that 25 years ago, uh, the most prominent social scientists in the United States uh, defined as super predators. Right? Uh, and, you know, we, when we talk about doing academics first in this context, I think it is essential to do all the things that I talked about in the first half of this discussion, which is insisting that academics and college and universities bear responsibilities for our shortcomings, not just in education, not just in university life, but also in how society approaches young people and their intellectual futures as well across the board. But I want to point to one uh, moment in the history of, of intellectualizing about crime and young people also that's important. And that is in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, there was a, a cross current of how we thought about these issues that was wildly powerful and utterly unpredictable. And in 1970, in 1971, in 1972, we had a near consensus among decision makers in philanthropy, government, and among people who thought intellectually about crime and punishment that the use of prisons themselves did not have a future. 
and that we would radically reduce or perhaps even eliminate prisons in the United States. That happened uh, concurrent more or less with the uh, various uprisings and trouble in the California state prison system, uh, with the siege at Attica Correctional Facility in the United States, um, and question, and of course, urban riots uh, beginning in 1965, ranging throughout the, you know, going on throughout the decade, um, in a way that brought questions of crime and punishment to the fore of the public imagination in the United States in a way it had never been before. And I just point back to what we talked about earlier, which was all of this happening coincidentally with extraordinary successes uh, with the civil, civil, civil rights revolution, right? All this is happening concurrently. And we intellectuals who might be, who understood themselves at least to be on the left, uh, adopted an ap approach which suggested that there was nothing left to do of any positive good within our prison systems. One uh, of these people in particular, who a poor guy who uh, uh, years later committed suicide, um, who had been a socialist, who had been a freedom writer, uh, came to the fore after developing a slogan, uh, really which was largely about promoting himself, uh, but which he thought would help bring down these institutions, which was that nothing works, right? And he stuck using that phrase uh, even af after it was adopted by the nascent uh, neoconservative movement. And um, that was championed primarily by someone like James Wilson. Uh, and so we had something in the United States where it was sort of a, what I call a cynical consensus, where people on both the left and the right agreed to leave the battlefield and accept together that we are incapable of doing good together. Right? And Progressives gave up hope that something good could happen in prisons, and conservatives absolved themselves of any responsibility that prisons should, be to, should exist to do anything but to punish severely, immediately, and with certainty. Right? And all of this led to the situation that we have now where we've gone from roughly 200,000 people in prison in America to the United States having roughly two and a half million people incarcerated, right? College in prison has a history which is also unpredictable and doesn't fit neatly in this story. But what that person who came up with that phrase, nothing works, a sociologist named Robert Martinson, came to realize was that the failure of prison-based programs, what they called in the medical era or treatments in prisons uh, of the you know, last hundred or so years before he wrote, um, was that the failure of all those programs rested in the fact that they were coercive, that they were without uh, any space to, for the subjects of those programs to have any dignity or choice. And so college and prison is controversial for precisely the same reason that it's effective. That it provides dignity and hope to people in prison and also a pathway to a better future. And that can be immensely uh, controversial. We've been really lucky in, uh, in BPI. We have been um, sort of adopted by allies within the Catholic Church, which has a sort of special place of influence in the United States. And we have an outfit uh, that Jason referred to called the Consortium for the Liberal Arts in Prison, where in addition to the 300 
full-time students we have in New York, we have an outfit helping other colleges and universities adopt this kind of work in different places, in different contexts. And it's never something where we want, um, you know, the University of Oklahoma, let's say we don't have a program there, uh, to do things just like we do. What we want to do is convince other schools in their localities to do things in their prisons in just the way that they do them on campus. Right? So we work with Washington University in St. Louis, Wesley University in Connecticut, Goucher College in Maryland. Uh, we're in about 15 states doing that. And we found that among our best allies are Catholic institutions who have a, uh, you know, we are very much a secular institution, but are similarly mission driven, right? Have a almost religious faith in what we do and our purpose uh, that I think in the landscape overall has been overwhelmed by a sense of cynicism, a lack of faith in young people, and in this context, a fear of young people. So we had, uh, for a spell, a lot of attention from the Cardinal of the Archdiocese of New York, who was uh, largely considered to be a conservative, and on these issues is a really wonderful and loyal friend. Uh, and he said something to me that has always stuck with me, which was that, in his view, the church, the Catholic Church, has always, has classically, believed that God continues creation through education, right? That the work we do is about cultivating individuals, their imaginations, their personalities, uh, and helping them become bigger and more fulfilled and more complete people over the course of their lives. Uh, and I think we share that view uh, with the church, but I hope that we also can approach uh, our institutions the same way. Institutions of government, inst institutions of law enforcement, and institutions of education all need to be prepared to change and evolve with courage, uh, and real optimism uh, in the generation ahead. So, thank you. Thanks very much to Max for that uh, inspiring account of what uh, BPI has been doing over the course of the last uh, near two decades. Um, I'm going to introduce our next two speakers now. Denise Edwards uh, was an avid world trekker until her wings got clipped. With an arsenal of short stories from exotic venues to federal lockdowns, Denise willingly shares her journey with a sense of ease. Accepting her flaws, she unapologetically invites listeners into another realm as she uh, traces the causes and effects of her choices. She is currently working on a book of short stories along with two full-length novels, The Black Print and Sons of the Soil, to be pun uh, published under the pen name Trinidad Pilgrim in the very near future. She is currently a student at the University of Toronto. Simone Val Davis is an American-Canadian mutt, a settler seeking to become more aware, a mother, daughter, sister, partner, and friend. She is also Associate Director of Trinity College's Ethics, Society, and Law Program at the University of Toronto. Since 2005, Davis's work has focused on alternative approaches to pedagogy, prison education, and an exploration of both the post-secondary and criminal justice systems in Canada and the United States. With the US-based Inside Out program, uh, she offered courses and led teacher trainings with Barbara Sher Roswell, she co-edited co -edited Turning Teaching Inside Out, a pedagogy of transformation in community-based learning. Simone went on to co-found Walls to Bridges, a Canadian national program now directed by Shoshana Polak, uh, and uh, she, uh, steering vision is provided by Walls to Bridges Collective. A Walls to Bridges uh, facilitator, Simone is also a proud member of the Toronto Collective and the National Walls to Bridges Network. 
grateful for the chance to present and publish about this work. So please welcome Denise and Simone. Hey everybody. Um, I'm good. Um, Denise and I are going to uh, sort of tag team this a little bit. So I'll, um, I'll get started and then turn it over to Denise and then come back in for a few uh, to kind of wrap, wrap up our portion and then really excited for some Q&A afterwards. Um, I, want, I want to take a minute and thank Jason Demers for inviting us and particularly for the, his goal as he conceived it for this particular program, which was to really, um, for this morning, to be a piece of the work of emboldening the cross-Canada post-secondary education opportunities for people who are currently incarcerated. And to that I just have to go, yes, absolutely. I also want to thank Max Kenner for his comments just now and also for his sustained and really inspired work um, on the Bard Prison Initiative. It is one of the strongest higher ed programs in the United States today. Um, and I want to thank my friend and Wall Street Bridges collective colleague, and Denise, and I, and I want to thank you for being here too. Um, there is a number of ways that you can do education in prisons and jails. There's a number of models that work really well, including peer-to-peer -peer education. There's a lot of people inside who have started very innovative programming. Um, I'm gonna talk about Walls to Bridges. That's the, one, the model that I'm steeped in. And um, so let me just sort of shape it out for you a little bit and then make a couple points. Um, Walls to Bridges, the model is to bring together incarcerated students and students um, from um, in prison or jail, and students from the university or college where the faculty member or course facilitator works. So everybody comes together as classmates once a week in the class conducted inside a prison or jail, and um, they. Uh, the class is taught in whatever field the um, faculty person specializes in, but Walter Bridges classes share a commitment to a particular pedagogical approach to being together. Um, the classes are very, they're held in circle, they're very focused on principles of open dialogue, learning to listen really deeply, learning to share authentically, learning to forge links between um, uh, what you're reading in texts and lived experience, and to think about those through the prism of one another. Um, they're also built around the notion that we learn with our whole selves, mind, heart, body, and spirit, and that it's um, really, so thusly, we do a lot of experiential activities. These include um, Augusta Boal's theater exercises, but much more as well. And trying to find ways to create dialogue, including using um, Circle, um, where people will break out of kind of a competitive model that can um, um, blind us or deafen us to uh, the insights that the people right around us are making. And um, it also, um, uh, we also have focus a lot on the work of collaboration. Collaboration and solving problems and thinking about things and engaging with issues really deeply and in a different way than we might normally do. And also collaboration on a group project um, if you ever want to talk about building teamwork, try to actually share a group project with an entire class, designing it and implementing it. Um, finally, the class, another really key to, uh, component of the pedagogy is the notion that we are going to learn together not only about what we're re not only engage in critical thinking about what we're reading and about what we're hearing and about we what we ourselves are sharing, but also like really taking time to think uh, critically and reflectively about the dynamics in the classroom and inside ourselves as we occupy occupy that space together. So really, a class a, a goal of the course is for inside and outside students together and the um, facilitator to um, uh, engage in serious shared inquiry and to build uh, a classroom community and to take note while they're doing, of, doing it of what kinds of obstacles are in the way of that that's based on mutual respect. Um, 
that one key component of that is that the, uh, there, we are really, a principle of Walls to Bridges is that there we, um, isn't a helper, helpy model. The outside students are not there to, um, to kind of try to help or, or it's, not a phil it's not a philanthropic model, it's not a tutoring model, it's not a mentoring model by any means. Everyone is there equally and um, that, that's sort of very, very pivotal to everything else that happens. Um, so in Canada, around the same time as the United States, for interesting reasons that I won't go into right now, um, post-secondary education had sort of been established in the 60s and 70s, in part because of activism on the part of people inside. Um, in the mid-90s, around the same time, it dried up in both nations. Um, and so there's a real gap, and that's one of the gaps that Jason's um, trying to ask us to address together this morning. Um, and there's also, uh, uh, it's really, so one of the main ways in Canadian prisons today that people are accessing um, um, post-secondary ed when they are is through paper correspondence courses. They've dried up. There's this thing called the internet. So they're really, really few and far in between now. And they're also kind of expensive for people inside to access. So there's a real need here. Um, Laurentian is one of the few. There's just a couple. Um, so our co-learning model does a few things at once. It works to address these really, really urgent educational equity issues that have so much to do with, are consonant with, and one piece with all of the equity issues that are shaping our, um, our society in such damaging ways um, and that are built in large part around racism, colonialism, and the um, kind of uh, ongoing, not just legacy, but presence of colonialism in, in, in our land. Um, at the same time as addressing those issues, um, we're also, it also challenges stereotypes and preconceived notions. It challenges stigmatization and inequality while developing a whole set of academic skills, including some that are hard to find, hard to develop in a university setting. Um, also, today's a really high stakes time for this planet and this world. Things are really, really urgent. And I think all of us need to find very, very new ways to really develop more muscular imaginations. We are going to have to imagine ourselves to a different world. And so um, my, uh, my uh, experience of the Walls to Bridges and the Inside Out classroom is that when you form learning communities, particularly unorthodox learning communities that involve people coming together um, across social divides, um, and you focus there on learning to listen really deeply and to speak really authentically, it can open up ground for new analyses that we desperately need, new perspectives, new solutions. So this is access to higher education at its heart, but it's also its radical re-envisioning as a bridge builder. Um, very briefly, Walster Bridges has a, an origin in the model that Inside Out Prison Exchange Program started, but it's an autonomous program. Um, and I co-founded it with the current director, Shoshana Pollock, Randall Duguid, and the entire Walster Bridges Collective. It's a Canadian program for practitioners here seeking to respond to the Canadian context. That includes engaging not just with indigenous pedagogy and principles, but also with indigenous educators and students. Um, and um, it also entails um, our default, unlike Inside Out, is that we want everyone in class to be getting four credit, good post -second, transferable post-secondary ed credits. Um, we've got a Walls to Bridges collective with a couple of chapters, one formed um, uh, at Grand Valley Institution in Kitchener, and um, that collective is composed um, uh, predominantly of uh, inside students and alums, and um, also outside students and alums, and, uh, and uh, faculty and other allies. 
um, that is very involved in developing and then offering an annual training for faculty from around Canada and beyond who are kind of thinking that they'd like to be facilitators of Wall Street Bridges courses and see if they can establish a program um, in their, at their own facility um, hosted by a local correctional facility. Um, we also do public education awareness workshops and there's and also we play a role there's a Toronto chapter and we play a role in helping there to be a place to go to where you can do really productive work if you've taken Wall Street Bridges inside and you're getting out it's um, we, a, a goal of the Toronto chapter is to say um, let's let's do some great work on the outside and have some kind of a sense of a bridge there. Um, nine correctional facilities and halfway houses have gotten involved so far in British, um, seven are in Ontario, two in Manitoba. Um, in, in BC, there's a program that's going to start soon at Simon Fraser Institutions. Eight universities have got, gotten involved so far, seven in Ontario, one in Manitoba. We've, um, so far, we've, we've uh, um, 73 instructors have been through a facilitator training, and there's 16 more are just about to start or a little later this week, and they're absolutely amazing bunch of people. Um, I'm just gonna see how long I've spent so far. Okay, um, I, very briefly, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Denise. A little bit about the benefits of this particular model and what it's good at. Um, well, as I've already said, the opportunity means not only developing academic skills, but developing the very crucial skill of learning to engage together on um, some very hard questions and to listen and to reason collaboratively across all sorts of differences that can exist in any classroom and exist in Wall Street Bridges classrooms too. Also, this is a kind of learning that is very, very student-owned. And that embrace of your educational role, and I was reminded when, the guy, when um, one of the valedictorians made the point in there about owning the responsibility and that that doesn't come cheap, it doesn't come free or easy, I really liked that point. It really has gigantic ripple effects for all the students in a Wall Street Bridges classroom to own the learning experience in the way that they're invited to. Um, they, um, and. Uh, it also does very, very profound work at dismantling preconceived notions about yourself, about others, about how society works, and about um, binaries that um, might have made sense to you before are likely to uh, fold. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to actually turn it over to, to Denise right now, but the one thing I'll say before I do, and then I'll come back and make some final remarks if there's time. Um, it's, it's a benefit to the people inside and it's an inspiration of some trust to the people inside and it, um, it's just a useful use of um, resources that this actually isn't a corrections-based program. It's a program that is emerging from the university and um, it's hosted by correction facilities that are, um, have been very, very generous in their support, but it's, um, it's, it's a unique program. That means a lot to the people on the inside as well as they kind of approach it. It's lacking that coercive quality and sort of stands distinct. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Denise now, who's, um, and then I'll come back. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I know it's a little bit of a heavy topic, but you know, it has to be addressed. Now, I'm going to go a little bit off script just to give you a little bit of background about myself. So, my parents came from Trinidad, and um, my father went to school here. Expo 67, got his degree. My mother, barely high school. So we thought this was going to be a great life here in Canada. My father was hired, but usually not for long. Last to be hired, first to be let go. My mother, on the other hand, she's always had jobs low-paying jobs. So I started 
growing up and I was like, I don't want to be like none of them. So I decided, let me forge my own path. So I found out about cocaine and selling it. So I uh, made um, I made a life traveling Central America, South America, loving it, making the money, and I get locked up. Um, my parents were not happy. I'm the only one in my family that's ever walked this road. But I explained it to them. I said, you, you go up there, you give your everything, and you come back home, and you know, you don't know if your job is secure. And you, to my mother, you work so many hours that we don't even know you anymore. They didn't take that lightly. They didn't accept it. They said, you are making a mistake. You are making excuses for your poor decisions. But I got locked up and I started thinking, basically, if every child is so, so, you know, so-called born with a clean slate, then why do some of us fall through the cracks? Why? There are many, many ills to this world. Some will never mend. Others, collectively, we can. Panda bears. I had a dream about a panda bear this morning. And then I remembered that they're here unknown. They were here alone in Toronto. And the government flew in their bamboo, fresh food, from China every day. And I'm saying those, I, my gosh, they have more opportunities than I do. We all love dogs. We all love pets. But when, you know, when people pay more attention to a pet than humans, then we have to kind of say, there's something wrong here. So I know that there's negative legacies of colonialism. It's very real. Have you ever heard of walk a mile in my shoe? Well, I would challenge anyone to walk a year in someone else's skin. Because you look at the world differently and the world will look at you differently. Canada has roughly 37 million people and it's going to grow. 4% indigenous people. And you know what? They are too overrepresented in the criminal justice system, just like people that look like me. In 2016, Crime was at a 45-year low, but incarceration at an all-time high. Indigenous women are the fastest growing prison population. Black and indigenous people are over-policed, over-represented. And what is the root cause? Sometimes we need to try to find out what are the root causes? Drugs, maybe? Abuse? can span a variety of reasons. But on top of that, we have to navigate a system that from the inception didn't include us. Traditional education didn't do anything for me. It did not build up my self-esteem because I could not see myself in any of those books. I was forever placed at the back of the classroom and I would look to see who was at the back of the classroom with me. I didn't like it. But, anyways, per year, $100,000 plus is spent on a man, per man, to house them in prison. Twice that number for women. Systemic barriers to accessing education and employment exist. People need to check their biases and privileges. Okay. 
You know, people think that when you're in prison, you just lie there, talk, play cards, whatever. No, we do a lot of work. We have programs. A lot of the programs are core, mandatory. And after I finished my mandatory programs, I wondered, where's the rehabilitation part of it? There wasn't any. I didn't see it. And um, the idea that some human lives are more worthy than others is not new. But when you get to prison, then you really realize and you look around. Taxpayers paid millions to incarcerate inmates. And then when the inmates come out, because usually we are released. So when we're out, then what? We face more barriers. So, this is just heavy for me, so that's why I'm taking a little while, and I don't want to really bore you. I won't really go on too, 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 too long. But the prison is like putting a Band-Aid on a sore, an open sore. You cover it up, but the sore is still there. Reintegration into the community and the labor force is not just an individual issue. There's a term for this dilemma, and the Swahili word for it is Kijiji, which means it takes a village. Kijiji means village. Didn't know that till the other day. Believe it or not, one way or the other, we are connected. We are interconnected. Reducing recidivism is critical for community safety as well as to the public. By strengthening economies, we strengthen nation. Our most precious resource, mankind. Recently released prisoners experienced much higher mortality rates than the general population. I was released 2016 and I have countless of friends that came out and they're no longer. And they had a lot to give to society. They fought battles and then when they came out, they realized that there's nothing here for them. Most of them, coincidentally, did not die of drug overdoses. They committed suicide because they didn't see a way out. Low-skilled individuals are more likely to have a criminal record. When inmates or ex-inmates are allowed the opportunity to live meaningful, productive lives after serving out our sentences, taxpayers won't be forced to pay for our in incarceration. Incarceration, rearrests, statistics pose, pose the facts that within three years of release, about 67% of released prisoners are rearrested. Those are the lucky ones. Many do not make it. Vocational and academic training is essential. There are no excuses for my poor decisions. Okay? Um, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. Do I believe in prison abolition? No, I'm not a prison abolitionist. I totally believe I, be I needed to be who I was, maybe for not the length of time. I was there for four years, and I still have four more years on paper. Something else could have been done. When I heard of the Walls to Bridges, I was thrown a lifeline. Simone came in, along with Shoshana, and presented what Walls to Bridges has to offer. Now in a population of 220 odd women, only 11 of us can get the opportunity. So it was fiercely competitive. I was very happy when I did. So I got in, and I got in expecting to be placed at the back of the classroom and it was a circle. We had 11 students from Wilfrid Laurier, so that's the outside students, and 11 students from Grand Valley. 
and we had preconceived notions about them and obviously they did with us and when we started going around in the circles doing our wagon wheels we found out that we had so much more in common than not and not only were we learning from each other we were teaching each other it felt so good self-esteem because prior to that I was thinking about when I come out ah I have these connections and I know what to do with them after my walls to bridges our graduation ceremony I really cried because another world was opened up to me I had potential we had potential I felt great um, <laughs> education not punishment is the key Canadians in prison are still Canadians you know, we're not animals, we're not aliens. Eurocentric educational system thrust upon others and they gave the others the sense of low self-esteem. Where are our heroes? Where, where are the contributions that people that looked like me made even to this country? I really never saw it in a textbook. I had to go beyond high school to find out. And had not been for the walls to bridges, I would have been ignorant. And ignorance is not bliss. More inmates than institutional employment. That's what happens also when you're locked up. We have more inmates than jobs. Jobs are highly coveted. Number one coveted job is Corcan. In my opinion, it's a sweatshop. You get six dollars, maybe 95 cents per day. Of that, 30% is taken out automatically for your room and board. <sighs> so for 220 women to be fighting for 11 spaces, knowing that you have at least a chance when you get out there. You know what that also did? It pit the inmates up against each other. Why did you get in? I had an inmate say to me, when there were only three of us as colored women getting in, I had a, a good friend of mine, white woman, she said, well, I think it's a social experiment. And I said, why do you think that? Well, I didn't get in, so obviously they're feeling sorry for a lot of people. Well, I let it pass. Was I upset with her? No, because that's her personal opinion. You know when you kick a dog and it's down, it's not nice. So when a boss reprimands the employer, the employer goes home, punishes his wife, slaps the wife around, wife takes it out on the kids, and then the kids, you know what happens to the dog. And that's what happens to a prisoner when there's nothing left for them to do. Society is an extension of that concept. Prison is a business that needs to be reassessed. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Can I propose to all present to be that potential student that is waiting for your, for your, for your teacher? Or can you be that teacher that's looking out for that student that needs you? Lagging generations behind, indigenous and people of color know the majority of us feel defeated and worthless. <laughs> Traditional educational, like I said, did not work for me. A little black girl 
constantly placed in the black in the back of the classroom wondering does this teacher really care about me I knew the answers to questions can she see my hand most times I never get picked wasn't chosen if you work to include more of a variety of inclusivity in school curriculum not focus on the 90% of European perspectives more people will feel empowered not sh I'm not shift blaming but the programs offered by the government has been missing the point for decades. All levels of government needs to come together with the think tank and try various solutions. There's so much more that I want to say, but I, I'm not going to say it. All I'm going to say is looking at your faces here today, I see where your heart and your head is making that connection. I see where there's at least one person in this room that's going to make something happen. Because we are all in this together. Well, we, we, we have so many challenges. And one of our biggest challenges when we get out is homelessness. You have nowhere to go. You're taking a minimum, a minimum wage job because you have low skill. Usually, you're gonna go right back into a state of depression and the cycle will start all over again. You become a statistic. And I don't wanna die a statistic. I entered the University of Toronto. I'm doing very well. I'm loving it. Um, whenever I have any challenges or anything, I feel free to approach the professors and let them know. I had class yesterday and I have class tomorrow. And I was so ashamed for missing it. So I told the professor, he shook my hand, he gave me a hug and he said, go do it. Go do it. We need more people like you to bring forward. I need to be the voice of the voiceless. We have many people that don't have a voice. So I went back to university to find the proper words. And I hope today that the words that I've presented to you might not be academic, might not be, a, might not be too street, but these three people here, I take my hats off. To you, I take my hats off. Because there are places that I would go to speak about this and nobody wants to hear. Nobody wants to hear. So, without further ado, thank you very much for looking at me as a person. And if you can find it in your heart, in your power, to allow or push for education in prison, I think Canada has the potential to be a world leader to set an example. Thank you, everyone. I really have to thank all our speakers. Um, tremendously inspiring. I'm in awe of, of the work that you do, the work that you've done. The, the inspiration that you bring to this room. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I don't know if these mics are on. Uh, we'll figure that out. Uh, you figure out your questions great thanks to house lights are on. Um, so anything that you have to ask uh, of, of Max, Simone, or Denise while we have them here, uh, feel free. <coughs> Fascinated by great. 
each of them very quickly. Uh, first, the first pressure is um, maybe political, which is to say, you know, uh, you should never try to generalize, I don't want to be a bigot, but you know, people on the right generally want us to do vocational education, God, uh, or train people to spend the rest of their lives, you know, apologizing for things, right? Uh, and people on the left, you know, want us to do only critical race theory or training people to, you know, become community organizers in opposition to mass incarceration or who knows, right? Uh, you know, our view is there's probably a place for any or all of that stuff somewhere, uh, but it's not what we do. Right? So first and foremost, you know, in terms of the content of the education, it's A, what we're qualified to do, not tailored for some imagined special or different group of people, number one. Uh, but number two, it is, you know, it's, it's, it's what we know how to do, right? So it's each of those things, number one, in terms of the content. Number two, in terms of the educational perspective, Right, you address this, this, this is sort of the glaring question of how in the world does someone who dropped out of school in the eighth grade go on to do college work immediately, right? And we, we askew completely, uh, you know, what sometimes is called remedial education. It's not something we do. It's not something we know how to do or are qualified to do. Uh, part of the solution lies simply in what I addressed directly in the talk, in, in the sense that these students recognize what's at stake immediately and come to the classroom with a, a different preparation, which in our view is more important. But that's sort of pocus pocus. Um, it's real, but it's kind of mystical, you know what I mean? Uh, we also, and I think finally, uh, this was always intuitive to us, we didn't know it was an intervention 18 years ago when we started doing the work to work this way. Uh, but the City University, University of New York has just started to do things this way. Others uh, of the sort of more uh, innovative community colleges in the United States are trying to do, starting to do things this way, which is to not do remedial education, or more precisely, not do it first, right? Learning grammar is an incredible bore you know, learning to dissect a sentence is an incredible chore if you don't care about the content of the sentence, right? Learning algebra is catastrophically boring if you don't understand how calculus or physics interacts, or, or the natural sciences, interact with your daily life, right? So if you put the content first and make the stories in literature or the content of history or the wonder of, you know, the natural sciences, and then you imbue those things in people's imagination, and then go back and do the techniques, the tactics, let's say, um, it's radically easier. Is that, okay. Yeah. In that regard, and you know, kind of coping and dealing with any uh, unresolved trauma, or you know, just kind of support in that regard. Particularly, particularly around their pursuing their education, or yeah, just in general. I'm not sure um, kind of what we have, or if that could be combined in an educational context as well. Um, um, Denise can probably speak to some some elements of this. I'd like to say just a word about it, which is that um, one of the things that's really important about that five-day training for, for facilitators of these courses is to have um, to understand a little bit about the um, and, and to be prepared to hold the frame 
for an environment where people are living not only have they endured past trauma, um, which may be the case for some of the outside students as well, but that additionally the environment can feel traumatic and they can be living in the midst of a very, very complex week. So the fact that the facilitation training zeroes in a bit on um, at, at least opening the doorway to, to understanding the kind of supports you want in place is one component of a response to your question. Um, um, additionally, uh, just in terms of what Balls to Bridges can do in this regard beyond just the um, frame of the class time together, is that also, um, and this is also of academic importance, the facilitator offers office hours at the jail or prison as well as beyond. Um, and the final thing I'll say that is not about a correctional response to mental health um, uh, provision, services provision, which is complicated story, but is it also that people, one of the things that actually can help um, uh, on, on multiple levels this pro program work is that people in class are supportive of one another and can support one another during the week as well and, and can bring to class, like the amount of the kinds of generosity that I've seen in a Wall Street Bridges class, I've seen nowhere else um, um, in terms of people um, in very, very nuanced, but very, very deep ways, um, supporting one another through really, really difficult um, times. So that kind of um, mutual aid and the kind of principle of mutual aid um, is one component that really makes a difference. Ra rather than strictly pathologizing it, it's like, let's see, let's see how we can um, create a, a strong community together. Thank you. Um, so there's three levels, security levels, in prison. There's medium, minimum, and maximum. And um, Wall Street Bridges tries to get um, students from every security level. Now normally, people in maximum, they're heavily medicated. And all these different intersectionalities play out. So you have, you're dealing with where you are, it, which does make it harder to study. But when you are in that class, in that space, the good thing about the facilitators, facilitator makes the class because the facilitator gets trained for moments such as those unlike the guards in that. So, Walls to Bridges provides space for that comfort, for that conversation, and um, for healing to take place. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I, I just want to address two or three things that really I think Simone alluded to, but just bring them out in a sort of more generalized context. Um, Simone used the, the word pathology, right? And I think one thing that's really tricky for us as advocates is on the one hand, you want people to have the best mental care for mental health, any. On the other hand, these institutions generally have a real problem with histories of diagnoses and pathologies and prescription, let's say, right? You follow me? Um, and I would say, certainly in the United States, those challenges are radically worse in institutions for women than for men, for a whole host of reasons. I don't think we don't have time, at least personally, I don't have all that much expertise to really expound on, but I think that is a consensus opinion. Um, so I, I think we have to approach this dilemma with a combination of real concern and empathy, but also skepticism. And that's a real challenge. And lastly, to uh, Jason's efforts and, and what we're talking about here, I would just remind everyone, you know, that we do know that a liberal education, that what Simone does, uh, that we do at BPI, is protective against mental illness in a way that does not risk the kinds of uh, 
diagnoses or, or um, the other side of the ledger, let's say, of what poor uh, mental health treatment can, can come with, baggage, uh, and often has in the past. Rick. Both programs are mentioned that it's very competitive to get into them. How do you go about selecting which students will get in? What are you looking for? Yeah, I'll just go first. I'm glad to talk about it. It's an important part of what we do. I do want us to say, I don't think it's an essential part of this conversation, right? There, there are a thousand ways of going about it, and whether it's a walls to bridges or you know something uh, more along the lines of what we do, there are many ways of going about it. I think what's most essential to um, to doing something broad and serious in Canada's prison system is that it is done in a way so that the potential student comes to the educational institution and is not pushed or prescribed or even incentivized from a, the correctional apparatus in order to do so. That's the most essential piece uh, that I think is uniform, irrespective of how Jason and his colleagues make progress. And I can get to how we do it, why we believe it, we believe very strongly, we talk for a very long time about it, I'm not sure it's worth everybody's time, but the other stuff really is. Yeah, I can, um, I'm going to similarly sort of um, sidestep aspects of the question in the interest of time. I um, uh, think that what, one thing that's really key about your question, though, is this notion that um, this reality that it's a competitive program with limited spots and there's all these other people, all these other people. So um, one of the things that I think is a challenge about doing this work at all is the fact that the um, need outstrips the capacity and also what it feels like if you are one of the people who's not in the class and you wish you were, or if you take a single class, which can sometimes happen um, with Walls to Bridges, it's not a degree granting program, although there's many. Um, the experience of a one-off, where you actually have the, you have the experience of like being brought into full experience of your own capacity and knowledge as a teacher, a learner, an unlearner, and, and, and then it's over. And you can feel like this, uh, this uh, a gap or a loss. It's it's and um, it, it's keen. Um, it's similar to another unmet expectation that really really impacts uh, people um, incarcerated participants in this in, um, in this pro in this in post secondary ed in prison. When you get out, there's um, an unmet there's an unmet expectation that our society has fallen down on, which is this whole myth of social mobility of pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, that if you get the education, a certain set of things are guaranteed to follow. Um, that's that's a, a failed dream, and it's perhaps the wrong way to even think about what we're able to offer. Shame on our society for that being the case, um, but it is. So um, uh, the response to the overwhelming need and to unmet expectations, both societally and also in terms of a program, has to be to um, keep pushing for more and for more quality educational experiences together. We, we desperately, desperately need it. And many of us um, who've been through graduate school and found ourselves doing a stint as a barista know plenty about that. Okay, we'll have to cut things off there, but uh, I, I do want to uh, invite you, as I said at the beginning, to come to the Rick Atrium. Uh, I've been notified that food has arrived, everything is set up in that space. Uh, we can continue conversations uh, on the way there and while there. Uh, Max is going to have a flight to catch, so, but, but I think he'll be around for, for at least a few minutes to have some, some side chats with, with you folks if you want to pull him aside. Just thank you so much for everything that you've given us.